How y'all doing, folks? Welcome to this edition of the Outdoors Bound Podcast. I'm George Noff. Glad you can be with us. Hooked up. So now I see that that fish is definitely hooked real well. So I'm going to go ahead and guide this right in like this. All kinds of fishing news this week. Let's start with the big story a lot of folks are talking about, the increase in striped bass stocking at Smith Mountain Lake. That was welcome news considering the numbers were cut last year. Here you go, honey. There's no better place inland in Virginia to catch striped bass than Smith Mountain Lake. It's a numbers fishery. There he is. Yeah, yeah, he's well beyond 30 inches. And it's a trophy fishery. He's heavy. But it's also a fishery that depends on stocking by the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. There is almost no natural reproduction. Last year, stockings were cut to roughly 230,000 juvenile striped bass. Now that could mean a drop in catchable striper numbers in a few years. This year, there was an increase to 300,000. Biologist Dan Wilson made the announcement at a meeting of the Smith Mountain Lake Striper Club. We're increasing the stocking from last year, but it's still a little bit below our 20-year average. It's somewhere in between. We had a school of stripers, uh, multiple schools of stripers, uh, in the thousands, I'd say, of fish push some bait back up in here. While the increase is welcome news to those whose livelihoods depend on striped bass, the problem, the reason for last year's cut, still remains. It's a decline in a vital forage fish, the gizzard shad. Now, striped bass thrive on them. But with gizzard numbers fallen, DWR biologists saw a corresponding drop in striper growth rates. They reduced striper stockings from historical levels in an attempt to give those gizzards a chance to bounce back. The only reason they increased stocking numbers this year is to maintain the fishery. It's a balancing act. I'm trying to prevent uh, a major hole in the fishery developing three, four, five years down the road by kind of tapering a reduced stocking until the growth gets back to where it should be. While those reductions may seem ominous, Wilson says the Smith Mountain Lake striped bass fishery remains strong. That action needed to be taken now to ensure scenes like this can play out well into the future. (laughs) There we go. Biologists saw a similar scenario unfold 20 years ago but didn't take action in time and the striper population nearly collapsed at SML. They want to keep that from happening again. The DWR is going to keep checking striper growth and the gizzard shed population. Now, you may ask what the correlation is between the two. While stripers elite almost anything, from a nutritional standpoint, gizzard shed are optimum and provide the biggest nutritional bang for their predatory buck. We're here in the smallmouth are picking up on the James and the New, and at SML, good catches of largemouth and big largemouth. The DWR rates Smith Mountain as one of the top trophy largemouth waters in Virginia. Smith Mountain Lake sets up really well for producing big bass, given the um, variety of habitat that's there, um, from shelves, uh, deeper water points, flats, underwater vegetation, in addition to some of the DWR's habitat structures that we've put in in recent years. Um, and, and combine that with an excellent forage base, um, and you've got not only good numbers of largemouth bass, but good numbers of big largemouth bass. Thank you, Alex McRickard. Now looking east, the shad run started on the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. It's early, but it's definitely a cherished tradition here in the Commonwealth. The thing that I love about shad and herring, especially here in Virginia, is that they're anadromous species, meaning they live out in salt water and then come into fresh water to spawn. And uh, to me, that there's nothing stronger of a metaphor of being part of, of, of part of the bigger picture than fish that live out in the ocean and then uh, come back to where they're spawned, where they're born, uh, to continue that process. That was Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources Region One Fisheries Manager Clint Morgison. Hickory shad numbers are going back up after a decades-long decline. American shad numbers, however, they remain low. I had the chance to go out with Clint and a DWR electrofishing crew a few years back to get a better idea of the number of shad returning to the James River. In the shadow of the Richmond skyline, there is something shocking going on. And we mean shocking, literally. We're trying to get a handle on the population of the Allocenes, and those are the American Shad, the Hickory Shad, the Alewife, and the Blueback Herring. If you ever wondered how the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources keeps track of how many fish are in a particular body of water, this is one of the ways they do it. It's called electrofishing. 
See those arms on the front of the boat with the wires hanging down into the water? Well, a low-level electric current is passed through those, not enough to kill the fish nearby, but just enough to stun them and bring them to the surface where they are netted. From there, the species is identified, measurements taken, sometimes they're tagged, sometimes fin or scale samples are taken, and then most of the fish are released back into the water where they quickly recover and fin off. On this day, the crew was looking at shad, herring, and striped bass. It's something they do weekly. These fish come in waves, they'll, they'll come in pulses, and so by sampling weekly, we sort of put the whole picture together for the spring. And that's important because what these crews learn can tell them a lot about what they have to do to make sure our various fisheries thrive. That's vital because there's more to fish than just fishing. Take those shad and herring, for instance. Uh, now they may just look like little silver fish, but uh, they're incredibly charismatic and they're the cornerstone of, uh, of these freshwater rivers along the Atlantic coast. Now, if you want to take advantage of the shad run as it picks up, you can use a variety of shad darts or small jigs to take them. Small spinners and spoons can be effective, too. One of my favorite places to fish for them is Ancaro's Landing in Richmond. And remember, you can keep hickories, but American shad have to go back. While a lot of folks toss them all back, if you do keep a hickory or two, they're delicious, fried, broiled, or grilled, and their roe is considered a delicacy funny how finicky, like we were saying, how finicky they are. Muskies are about to go on the spawn right before they do that, and right after, they go on the feed. The problem is, at this time of year, with lots of rain, conditions, especially on rivers like the New and the James, can be challenging. Muskie expert and author of Next Level Muskie Fishing, Stephen Paul, has some advice. You know, you're going to get the strikes. you got to just spend the time on the water. It, it, regardless of what you're dealing with, it's an obstinate fish. It's just the mental grind. You deal with muddy water, you deal with high skies, you just gotta stay in the game, keep grinding. You're gonna get those opportunities. And we're fishing these, they're, they're pre-spawn fish, but they are almost ready to go. We are seconds away. You know, it, it, at least for where we're at geographically, a good sign's the dogwood trees, right? Obviously your water temp's gonna tell you a lot of what you need to know. But you see the dogwoods, we see I have some budding trees here. We're just on the cusp of the spawn. These fish are trying to keep their calories up for that, which is the biggest endeavor they do each year. So if they're willing to bite, we just gotta make the cast and put the time on the water. Those fish are gonna be in that spawning window for at least a month. Reproduction on the new and the James is self-sustaining. <laughs> If you're a seasoned hunter, then you're already getting ready for spring gobbler season when it opens next month. But if turkey hunting's something you've always wanted to do but maybe haven't given it a shot yet, you might think about taking a VDWR turkey hunting skills course. There are a number of them being conducted around the Commonwealth on March 23rd and 24th. You can sign up online at the DWR's website. We're all looking for gear bargains. I mean, who's not with inflation the way it is these days? Outdoor Life is out with its list of the best spinner reels for 100 bucks or less. Overall in that category, Outdoor Life likes the Daiwa Acceler. It retails for just about $100. The magazine rated the Pen Pursuit 4 as the best saltwater reel. It'll cost you 70 bucks. The Shimano Sedona FJ was rated the best all-purpose reel. It retails for $80. Finally, Outdoor Life rates the Lose Speed Spin as the best budget reel. It sells for 60 bucks. Now, very few reels are still made in the United States, so finding a U.S.-made reel these days may feel a lot like finding a unicorn. But if you're looking for an American-made reel, you don't have to leave the state of Virginia. I got the chance to tour the operation of Siegler Reels in Virginia Beach. Oh, God! If you've ever fished, you know the heart-pounding moment when a big one takes off. Your reel better be up to the task. Oh, brother. These days, most reels are made somewhere else. A U.S.-made reel? Well, that's a unicorn. But if you want to do a little unicorn hunting, come to Virginia. It's definitely a challenge to try to keep everything stateside, to keep the price just in the right zone, too. So That's Wes Sigler, president and founder of Virginia Beach-based Sigler Reels. My original mill was right here, the little one. It's doing, it's still live and working. Every reel Sigler has made has been produced right here in the United States, right here in Virginia. As us fishing reel makers and, you know, outdoorsmen and women, you want your stuff made here, and the one thing is to keep it going forever. So this is a SG, 
um, lever drag, conventional reel, it's actually left hand. Wes says reel making comes out of his lifelong passion for fishing, both conventional and fly, and that turned into an obsession for making his product here too. Just became a passion to try to keep it here, you know, and one machine led to another machine to another machine. <laughs> When you talk to tackle makers, you hear about inspiration for making something better coming from experience on the water. Wes is no different. He gets his best ideas while fishing. Any day you're on a fishing trip, anytime you're on the boat, you, you'll come up with three or four new things. Now you just say, oh, would that affect just a small percentage or is this something that could change the world? Um, you never know. Sigler Reels traces its roots to conventional saltwater fishing, but they're used on freshwater too. And then there are the fly reels and a game-changing lever drag system West developed. You can pull back on the lever and feel max drag that you have it set for. Maybe that's three pounds. Started to fly fish, salt water, big game stuff, and then next thing you know, uh, the mousetrap could definitely change. So I came up with a new design and um, just really targeting really mean fish, some of the biggest fish in the world. And yeah. Next thing you know, I'm having a fly reel line that I have now that's probably taken as strong as our conventional reel lineup. So it's been a pretty neat journey. And that journey of making reels and creating jobs right here in America is one Wes says is a company commitment. We're proud it's made here, and that's that's the biggest thing. It's making something in America. It's, it's a challenge. It's not, it's not easy. It's a lot of hard late nights and struggling, but it's worth it. My thanks to Wes Siegler. Now, those are high-end reels, but they last, and they work like they should. I got a chance to fish them on SML and on the Chesapeake Bay, and I can tell you they are quality reels. Now, I know a lot of you love to fish and hunt, but some of you just want to get outside and get some exercise. Who can blame you? Have you thought about mountain biking? Our region is known as a mountain biker's paradise. A few years back, our friend Haley Henson decided to give it a go. Before you can start hitting mountain biking trails with this kind of speed, bike skills instructor Dan Lucas says there are a few things you'll need. So you need a good bike, um, something that's going to be able to handle the terrain, a knobby tires, uh, sometimes full suspension if uh, required, and you're going to need a great helmet. So please don't buy something cheap, buy something that's going to protect your head. A lot of times gloves are a good uh, choice as well. What are some of the basics that you teach people in order to safely ride? What I like to start with is the foundational skills. So number one, uh, you just need to make sure you have your fingers on the brakes because you got to stop if there's trees coming. Uh, number two, you want to keep your eyes up ahead. Looking where you're going. And number three, you want to keep your pedals flat because you don't want to catch those on rocks or roots down below you. And uh, make sure you're in a comfortable position to be able to tackle the obstacles. And speaking of comfortable position, Dan says heavy feet, light hands help with balance. You're going to be balanced right now. So if I shake the bike around right now, you're not going to fall over because you got that weight on your legs. Once you've got these basic skills down, you can hopefully change any mountain biking intimidation into pure exhilaration and take advantage of the incredible mountain biking region in which we live. Thanks, Haley. Now, she told me some of the favorite places to mountain bike in our region are the Arcadia area of the Jefferson National Forest, Carvin's Cove, and Mill Mountain Park. Of course, if your idea of getting outside is at a slower pace, then this is for you. 30 seconds of solitude on the Upper James River. And that just puts your mind right, doesn't it? All right, folks, time for me to float on downstream. Thanks for being with us. Until next time, I'm George Nolf of WFXR's Outdoors Bound. Tight lines and good hunting, y'all. You build the mountains in your dreams. You lead the world so you can breathe. Whoa. You walk on fields inside your mind. You cross the oceans and the skies. Whoa. Like you found a better way Don't fight them all What they say Just turn around and walk away But if you leave again Just take me there with you But if you leave again Just take me there with you